Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by two very special guests. Uh, author Ian C. Esselmont, author of the novels of the Malazan Empire. Cameron, how are you doing? Hello, AP. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Oh, excellent. And because this is actually going to be a discussion of uh, the mid-series sort of read of the novels of the Malazan Empire, so Night of Knives, Return of the Crimson Guard, and Stonewielder, I'm joined by my good friend, Dr. Philip Gis. Hello, Philip. Hey, AP. It's great to see you, as uh, always. Well, and, you know, at least we're all, you know, wearing proper jackets this time, as opposed yeah. to the tank top Dr. Fantasy. <laughs> What what can I say? Now you know why they call me Dr. Fantasy. <laughs> oh, dear, oh dear. So, so Cameron, to fill you in, uh, Philip and I, we've we've been doing this this read along or this this read through of the novels of the Malazan Empire. And obviously I've I've read the novels of the Malazan Empire, um, which I hope you know. And Philip has has started reading them. So we've read the first three. Uh, and obviously we, we've already chatted about Night of Knives. Uh, and then we did Return of the Crimson Garden and Stonewielder. So now that we're, we're sort of halfway through the, uh, the the series, we thought it'd be nice to have a chat about them. Let's talk about some uh, grander themes and some specific instances from them. And we're going to structure this uh, so that, you know, viewers uh, don't have to bail out immediately. We'll do it book by book, if that's okay with you. Certainly. Yeah. <clears throat> so... Philip, uh, seeing as you're the 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 noob, the newbie, uh, as the the kids today say, yes. Um, why don't why don't we start with like your impression, like the the things that you sort of were picking up now that the series is building? We'll start with Night of Knives. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, so beginning with Night of Knives, and uh, I think that there are some themes that we'll we'll be talking about more than once here, um, but. In Night of Knives, which I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, I just was immediately uh, impressed by the atmosphere uh, that you established in, in that book. Um, I thought that one of the prominent themes is certainly, and this will be fairly obvious, I think, to any reader, but it's betrayal uh, and the, the nature of uh, the relationship between and these are obviously spoilers for Night of Knives, everyone. So, um, but the relationship between Lacine and Kalenbed is something that really gets filled out here. So if any readers who want to know that history, any readers who want to know um, more about why Lacine did what she did, I think uh, you really need to read the novels of the Malazan Empire uh, to get the full picture, uh, or as full as you're gonna get uh, of this character, Lacine, who I think is a fascinating character, uh, but, it's it's an interesting thing about this, we say betrayal, and it has a negative connotation to it, but one thing that we'll be talking about, I'm sure, uh, and when we talk about this and the next two books, is just how <clears throat> betrayal can be a, a more multifaceted thing, that it, it can be, uh, it can have both positive and negative repercussions, it can have both positive and, and negative motivations. And so it's not a simple thing, in other words. It, this is the Malazan world, so not, it, it's not going to be simple. So I, I felt that that was a very interesting thing. And, and I'm wondering if, if um, that is something that you wanted to do when you were writing both this and, and the future, both Night of Knives and the future. Were you kind of wanting to sort of help the reader understand this character, Lacine, a bit? Uh, and um, because I think a lot of people respond to her very negatively. Uh, in, in, by reading just if they had only read um, the Malazan book, The Fallen, for example. Um, so is that something you wanted to do is to give us a more complex picture of Lacine and help us understand the that what she was doing wasn't necessarily just selfish, that what it wasn't just ambition, it wasn't just a grab for power, that she was put in a position where it was almost as if she were given very little choice in the matter. And also because of the way Kellen uh, operates um, and his lack of interest in actually running an empire um, and all that. So yeah, what were you, what were you up to with Lacine? I'm very curious about that. <clears throat> yeah, I, 
she's definitely one of the characters that I, I wanted to expand upon. I wanted to uh, show the readers more of and uh, do justice, I, I hope, to, to her and, and the other characters who we hadn't been seeing very much of. Um, and um, not necessarily try and you know turn people's opinions around, but just show the bigger picture of you know what's hidden beneath her surface and the surface of that character. And and of course, as we do in in, in our world, is just let the readers judge and let them decide on her um, motivations and uh, her justifications. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, one of the the things that I, I find really interesting about Night of Knives is um, obviously Erickson, you know, started with Gardens of the Moon and it was like the, the start of this big series that he was doing this 10 book series. But you actually start with one of the uh, foundational moments that sets everything else in motion yeah. that you have this night when Callum Ved and, and Dancer are ascending and the tremendous change that rocks the empire from that moment on the repercussions that ripple through both your series and ericsson's and yet they're not the the focus of the point of view that that incident is happening but your your perspective of it of all of these big this big tumultuous event this this empire shaking event you don't choose to be right in that moment. You you let the reader see glimpses of it. So that is something I'm really curious about, the picking of the, those perspectives to show that night. What, why show it from two people who basically aren't involved, who are only catching these glimpses? And why not show it from right in the middle of the action? Not that I like it, but the the decision making that went into that. Um, well, I think I was more interested in the uh, consequences of the action, the, the consequences of the event, and how it affects uh, people who are in, in the empire or associated with the empire and the, the social and political uh, repercussions uh, from people on the, you know, the street, so to speak, um, rather than um, getting right into the individuals involved and, and then being caught up in their own uh, preoccupations. Right? Uh, that's not what I wanted for, uh, to, for the portrayal of, of this particular event. Yeah, because, uh, you know, with, with Kiska and Temper, obviously we have the, the young, almost like ingenue, the, the young, naive, callow youth that we're so used to seeing, perceiving in fantasy being the the point of view for the the reader but then the the grizzled veteran who's just tired and cynical you actually two fantasy tropes two fantasy perspectives that we're used to but you put them in a, a narrative structure of all of these events but they're not they're not core to it so this almost subversion of what stereotypically happens in a lot of fantasy but still utilizing the same trope so I think this goes to a style that you've used, I, I multiple perspectives on things, but not necessarily the, as you said, like the, the big figures who have their own things going on, but looking at it from the perspective of people who are witnesses to it. And then obviously as the series goes on, that's where we see a lot of these ramifications. We see this ripple effect, but with, with Night of Knives, um, that balancing of uh, trope versus subversion of trope and you know obviously as a fantasy writer you you have fantasy influences why did you go the route of trying to subvert that was it frustration with fantasy or just trying to play with it to to see what you could do um well this uh speaks to our, our uh, broader discussion about the you know the, the goals of the project as a whole um but in uh night of knives as the first novel I wanted an entree that was familiar. And, and so the readers could, could say, oh yeah, I know this, I know what's gonna happen and feel comfortable stepping into the world and, and following the reader, um, the reader following the writer along. Uh, and then slowly sort of turn things and say that, well, actually this, 
this youth who you met isn't going to be the hero. Um, this, you know, you're, is, is just the witness to events. Uh, and um, that's another theme, of course, is, you know, when, how are our things represented is becomes the meaning, uh, not necessarily the actual events themselves. And, and so it's the witnesses who are uh, actually deciding the importance and the significance and the meanings of, uh, of what is going on. Uh, and these are, these two are the witnesses. He, uh, Temper, has seen so much, seen too much. Uh, and she is uh, eager to get out there and, and experience things. So that's, that's really interesting because uh, it, it, it makes total sense when you explain it that way. And uh, what AP was talking about is, so we know a, a Malazan reader kind of knows what's going to happen in a way. So by choosing to make this in a way temper the story of temper and Kiska as they're witnessing these much bigger events, these are these are they're us in the story. They're 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 our means of getting into this story because they're essentially okay. They're not exactly little people. Tempers ha had quite a, a storied history, but they're they're more little people <laughs> that we can identify with as the readers, and it becomes their story. So we get surprised as well even though the big events we know what's going to happen uh but we don't know the story of temper and we don't know the story of kiska yet so i i love that that gives us a novel way of experiencing the big events also i think you you, you do a great job of introducing some other themes through those pov characters for example ambition is a big theme uh, as far as i can see so far in in the novels of the malazan empire and in Night of Knives, we see it, I think, primarily, well, not just through Kiska, but she is uh, a, a youth with a lot of ambitions. Um, and of course, it's something that is relevant to uh, Lacine as well. Um, and then with Temper, the more experienced person, the veteran, uh, I think you have a, another theme that I, I find to be very beautiful and prominent in the series so far, which is kind of the weight of the past. Right, both in terms of a, a broader historical past, but also a personal past. So that is something that comes through beautifully with temper um, in there. So I, I, I thought they were great choices for POV characters. Well, thank you. And, and they're, of course, as I was saying, they're, they're both tropes. And, and so we're operating with, within uh, the, the genre, uh, but at the same time, not necessarily being impatient with them or fed up but just saying well you know we can do more with this or we can try and do more with these uh and and push them um uh, so um what steve and i were uh, always trying to do was uh play with all of these conventions and tropes uh yeah. and not just reverse them and not just challenge everything uh, because you know we're not writing tristram shandy here <laughs> we we want the readers to follow along and not get <laughs> totally lost <laughs> Yeah, I love the, the, that relationship between Kiska and Aguila because yes, it's a trope. You have the mentor and you have the young person, but they feel like such real characters to me at the same time. Uh, and the relationship is is uh, there's there's genuine affection. You know, there's there's uh, it feels human to me, even though we're in a fantasy setting. Uh, it it feels very real and compelling. So yeah, great use of that trope. <laughs> But I, I, I think this goes to a point about tropes. Uh, like, what is a trope? A trope is uh, something we've come to see again and again, but it, it was there as a convention uh, to begin with because it was useful. It was modeled on something that happened. And so, you know, people, I think, throw the word trope out. They use it in a very pejorative sense when all it is is, is describing something that routinely appears. And so um, it's for a lot of, uh, at least in my experience, a lot of criticism of, you know, this thing or that thing where the thing is being labeled, be it a trope or a cliche or something like that, uh, that, that thing itself is not necessarily negative because it's all about how it is being used and how it is being integrated into the narrative. And one of the things that I greatly enjoy about the Malazan world in general is the origins of it as a role-playing game. There are moments when I'm reading it and I go, that that reminds me of something straight out of D&D. &D. 
and it's so well integrated into the world that I don't think of it as a negative. That the uh, I think when a lot of the D and D fiction was being published, a lot of the uh, Forgotten Realms uh, or Andre Norton's Quad Keep or the Dragonlance books, that there there was a, a a sneering attitude to them, that they weren't looked at as as literature. They were looked at as I believe the the term was extruded extruded fantasy product, um, <laughs> and it was a, a rather sneering critical term, but. One of the, the things is obviously just because something appeared or was used or was defined somewhere else, how it is being used, how it is being integrated into a narrative, um, that is the thing that gives it value. And with with the novels of the Malazan Empire, with uh, Night of Knives, right, we have the grizzled veteran, we had the, the young, ambitious, uh, would-be uh, assassin bodyguard type. We have the sorcerer. We have all of these different things, the, the monsters coming out that, that need to be faced off. Um, there's aspects of it that are almost like that RPG group running around in a town. And you, you, can, you can isolate all these things. But because it's integrated into the narrative, because the narrative is shaped by it, because the narrative has smoothed out those outlines so that they blend into the world, that's when you get something that, yeah, it might have been inspired by or uh, influenced by a role playing game and and the different conventions of that. But it is its own thing. It is a novel. Uh, well, novella or novel? I always get lost on the word count on this. Cam? Um, I would say it's a very slim novel. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, we'll, we'll call oh, it a slim um, novel then. Yeah, between 90 and 70,000, uh, 70 to 90,000. You know, very slim novel. Uh, well, that's obviously because it has such a dark cover. We know that's slimming. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, you have that, you you have that integration of these things, and um, people who are dismissive because of RPG origins, I think, miss the point. Literature is inspired from from lots of different places, from film, from other literature from personal experience, from authors like yourself take inspiration from everywhere to create. So why are RPGs and computer games and all that sort of stuff off limits as a source of inspiration? Is it because we sneering lit academics don't understand gaming? <laughs> but I don't know. No, I don't know exactly, but I would put in again, you know, I got to put in my two cents on voting for it as um, because of its um, cooperative nature. Um, it's a challenge to authorship because authorship is shared uh, and everybody has a stake uh, and everybody contributes if you have a good group uh, and everyone should feel involved and integrated into the uh, narrative. And that's a challenge to someone who's coming from a hierarchical approach and saying, well, no, you have to have an authority here. And well, no, it's a, a group. It's a communal experience. Uh, that's a cultural challenge on, on, for, for, for one thing, on one, on, on one level. And obviously, if we think back to a lot of uh, oral storytelling, where, you know, it's like someone getting up and, and telling a story and then the next person getting up and building on it, you know, we have uh, across lots of different cultures, cooperative storytelling as a natural function. And of course, gaming, because it, it's not done, uh, it, it's done in purpose, person when you're talking, is, is tying into that almost uh, oral storytelling tradition. You, you could even argue that the idea of the solitary author is the aberration, actually, that for most of human history, stories were a, a, a cultural uh, belonging, that, that stories were part of a broader culture and that the bards were simply telling stories that almost everybody already knew, but it, the enjoyment was in the telling. And so they were a shared cultural tradition. And even, even as late as, uh, you know, it's literacy that changed that obviously. Literacy came into the equation and didn't change it overnight because even in the time of you know, Shakespeare, for example, he stole all his plots for his plays, uh, except for two, right? Uh, the uh, Tempest and a Midsummer Night's Dream. 
the fairy place uh, he made up, but the rest, he stole the plots from Chaucer. Go back a, a little earlier, Chaucer, he, he literally would translate something from French or Italian and insert it right into one of his Canterbury tales. So, I mean, there is no, no concept of individual ownership of stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, maybe with the gaming thing and we're just going back to an older tradition here in a way. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Because the the reason I, I I thought this would be interesting to talk about is uh, obviously one of the things that is a signature of of your your books is this notion of the thing that happened, but depending on the character's perspective of it, and then the time afterwards from from when it is remembered or recounted, the meaning of the event changes and she and is shaped and is twisted and we have this evolution of an event inspiring a a myth or a legend becoming something else and this this constant movement and shifting and changing of what narrative means um which obviously you know is is, is part of uh, we see this in reader response theory about the meaning being created at the back of a person's head because they are ascribing meaning and we see it in semiotics and semantics as well. But we're ascribing meaning to words. We're constructing the narrative meaning ourselves individually from what is there. And one of the things that we see in Night of Knives is this legendary event. But the meaning for the individual people is different. And we see that it's radically different from <clears throat> the legend of what happened that night or yeah. the, the myth of what happened that night. So... Um, that and and um, as the individual changes, as the indiv individual grows, uh, then the meaning that they choose to uh, emphasize uh, changes, right? And so, uh, the, and the way that they would uh, remember or think about the event, uh, it changes due to their own uh, needs or uh, desires or goals as they go along. Uh, so it's all, it's, yeah, it's all very malleable. Uh, as a, an, a cultural entity um, that's sort of existing out there to, to, to be used, however the individual may, may, may choose. Wow. Uh, there is one other theme, uh, if, if we're done on that topic, from <laughs> that I think you introduce really effectively in Night of Knives. And it's a theme that becomes much bigger, much more prominent as the so far anyway, as the series has progressed. It's something you introduce at the very end of Night of Knives, and that is the idea of the other. Uh, and of course, in this case, we don't really get to see the Storm Riders up close. And they're, they're introduced in the beginning of, of Night of Knives with that really incredible atmospheric opening. Um, and it's from the perspective of the, the, the merchants on the ship that get overtaken by the wrong place, wrong time, I guess, <laughs> while the Storm Riders are on their way to Malaz Island. And we see one of them at the end in a way that surprised me, actually. Really, you really surprised me with that ending where you have the grandfather and his two grandchildren and they discover a, a storm rider on the beach at the end of, of the book. This is the last thing that happens. And the grandfather sends the kids along and says, don't worry. And, and then he slits the throat of the storm rider after the storm rider ask uh what exactly does he say i want to get this right or why are you why uh, you remember the line yeah why are you why killing are you us killing? why are you killing us and that just blew me away i just thought oh my okay what's going on here so i think you very effectively introduced this theme of the other um which is um much more prominent later but uh nevertheless i think beautifully done here and uh really nice setup that's you know sometimes i think of night of knives as almost a separate thing from the rest of the novels of molaz and empire because it it happens earlier and you could read it as a standalone but that to me is one of the things that actually really connect it uh, that connects it to the rest of the books as well as you know kiska and, and some of the other characters will, will of course turn up again so um but yeah that was i mean is that something you really wanted to actually set up there this 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 other theme or was that uh, something you were thinking about you were going to be doing 
were you thinking ahead to Stone Wielder at that moment? Well, um, certainly. I mean, that's uh, coming up again and again and again is, is uh, the, the, that other and the, the turn on enemy or not and deserving of treatment or not. And, and um, yeah. that definitely is what I knew was going to be something that was going to be an ongoing theme. Uh, and, and not just for my works, but I think it's something that belongs to the, the world as a whole. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because of course, otherness, otherness turns on, absolutely depends on uh, perspective and point of view. Yeah. And I think this, this is a good moment to sort of transition into Return of the Crimson Guard. So uh, those of you who have not read Return of the Crimson Guard, this is now going to be spoilers for Return of the Crimson Guard. Thanks for watching. But this the, well, the idea of of otherness um is entirely dependent on uh, self-identification self-identification group and perception of an outsider so it is hinged on perception and one of the things that we see coming into return of the crimson guard is the multiple perspectives being used to show the same events to show how perception of those events is radically different dependent on where you are standing yeah. and uh it in a sense uh can sort of destabilize a narrative that we're, we're kind of more used to which is this is what happened you know follow along with this but when you're showing it from multiple different angles there's no longer that conviction of this is what happened this this is what history is this is these are the events of that night um, it's now balanced on nuance and it's balanced on perspective and what one side others about another, that side may other about them. So there's monstrosity created through ignorance or uh, through psychological need to project as the enemy. Um, well, this is another one of the, the literary techniques, if you will, or I, that that uh, Steve and I wanted to um, bring into and and sort of deploy and use in 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 the genre, uh, and uh, so you know whether we succeed that's that's not for us to say, but we're we're trying to show that um, we can use uh, a literary sensibility to um, tr problematize. Uh, the accepted tropes, again, uh, uh, in being used in fantasy and use them to show all kinds of things that you can't necessarily get at in, uh, say, a contemporary lit. Well, what, what, what do you think is the strength of fantasy to, to play with these things that contemporary lit doesn't have? Uh, well, I think Steve's talked a lot about um, the... Um, ideas of playing with uh, mythology. And I don't myth mean mythology just as gods and uh, origin stories, but myths that we have about ourselves. Uh, national origin myths, uh, myths about na um, nations, myths about identity. Uh, and uh, I think you can really show that um, very directly in, in the fantasy genre without you know, being as, um, uh, what would the term be, didactic, <laughs> as you might be. It's interesting, too, just how quickly things can shift. And we see that in Return of the Crimson Guard, where you have, essentially, in the beginning, you have this identity, Malazan Empire. But then you have the fragmentation. You have the rebellion going on, uh, starting out in, in the West, and then things falling apart, and people asserting older identities. No, I'm not Malazan. I'm Unten, or I'm whatever. Yeah, I'm you know I'm uh, Quontalian, or, or whatever it might be. Um, so th that happens. But then later, an external threat arrives, and we go back quickly to the other identity of Malazan, again, um, when the external threat arrives. So it, it's how quickly that can shift and how that shows, again, the complexity of the layers of identity that can exist within an individual who has these various loyalties all within the same story. Uh, and they can manifest depending on external circumstances. 
uh, and, and it happens really fast too. Uh, so it's, or, you know, I, I, am I someone from Lihang or am I someone from this province or am I someone who is a Malazan, you know, and that can shift according to the individual's circumstances. So that's really interesting. Well, um, yeah, um, I like that, you know, you're willing to go along with all of this, um, uh, and, and uh, it's not something that uh, I think is limited, of course, you know, just to our uh, genre or to our treatment of it, right. uh, but it's everywhere. Uh, and that's the, again, the thematics, the broader idea of um, people fighting within themselves uh, for their own, their own identities struggling and they're trying to make sense out of their own conflicting loyalties um, and that's, you know, the old uh, self-divided uh, literary themes. Yeah, because it's, I mean, it's one of the things that I've always liked about fantasy and, and science fiction is the ability to take a, a real world mimetic issue, a real world issue, but to move it into a more fantastical arena and to disguise the, the specifics of it to give a reader a chance to experience that conflict uh, from multiple angles without the preconceived notions about what that conflict is or how it should be resolved. And, you know, we see this with uh, like Romeo and Juliet, a very straightforward example of this, you know, in Fair Verona where we lay our scene, but it's, it's two warring sides that are then symbolically represented by uh, Romeo and Juliet and then the the conflict between them breaks them apart and you go oh it's the the greatest love it's a terrible love story it's an absolutely appalling love story <laughs> romeo romeo is desperately in love with rosalind at the start and then he sees a new bit come in onto the scene and he's like oh no i love this one now this is not a love story it's a terrible love story but anyway <laughs> then these teenagers run off all open it all ends badly stay in school kids don't do drugs but what I liked about it is as soon as you step away from the specifics of the story, and this is why I think it endures, and you apply it to um, a hotbed political issue, say uh, Palestine and Israel, and think about it in those terms, that suddenly you can just move Romeo and Juliet and put it in, in the, uh, that conflict. Or put that conflict as there was a whole series of books when I was growing up uh, across the barricades about Protestant and Catholic in Northern Ireland. Sure. And you can you can have it on a micro scale and you can expand it out to a macro scale of looking at this thing purely in terms of the symbolism of, of two sides. But as soon as you write about the West Bank or as soon as you write about Northern Ireland or as soon as you write about specifically one of those things, uh, sp a specific thing, there are people who will have an immediate prejudgment on it. But if you move it into the fantastical realm, if you move it into a science fictional universe or a fantasy universe, then people can actually start to think through it and gain a different perspective of looking at things from a different point of view and, and explore, you know, very few, very few sides in a conflict have clean hands. And it's an acknowledgement of that without feeling like it's an attack on your own personal identity or your own personal culture or something that you identify with, that it gives you that chance to step back from it. So I think that aspect of what you explore in Return of the Crimson Guard, where we have people acknowledging a deeper cultural history within a cultural history of the empire. And it, it's not to say that you, you, you have to be one or the other, you can be both, but it can split your loyalties. It can change your perception of what that thing is. And it's not necessarily that just because you have a different perception of say the Malazan empire, because you come from one section of it with a different history. It's not to say that you are right or wrong and someone else from a different part of the empire is right or wrong. There are different perspectives and different views of what that imperial history is. And the way that you explore that, looking at those tensions running through the society, that I think is one of the enduring and most compelling aspects of the novel. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> and it's not just limited to, to, to um, these first three, I hope. Um, uh, I think we will see this going on. And of course, it's all through uh, Steve's works because you can talk about, you know, the novels of Malaz, you know, there's a sort of a commonality, uh, I think, running through the whole thing. Yeah. And it's, I'd say a similar complexity when dealing with some of the other themes as well. Uh, we talked about ambition before and here, one of the prime examples uh, is Malak Rell, of course, who is effective, uh, if not well loved, um, but you, you have to admire his, <laughs> his effectiveness. Or let's talk about the Crimson Guard. You know, they have taken a vow and this is a, a pretty darn serious vow here. Uh, and, and it has some major repercussions and they are unrelenting in their fulfillment of this vow uh, to essentially- hey, Hang on, unrelenting? They go know. on a big holiday for about a hundred years. Oh, they, just, they, go, they go on cruises, oh, they're cruises. checking <laughs> nights. <laughs> I think it was a bit of a forest holiday there. Fun, uh, fundraising. <laughs> fundraising. <laughs> oh geez, yeah. Well, they started. They should have started to go fund me or something. That would have been a lot easier. But, um, yeah. but so they they had this this very I think um, driving ambition, which is to destroy the Malazan Empire. But there are consequences. I I compared them to other literary figures like Ahab or Roland in the Dark Tower series. And we had a viewer who brought up Feanor and, and his uh, sons and the Silmarillion. These are characters who are essentially admirable characters, but they have taken upon themselves this vow, this obsession, um, and everything else is up for grabs, is, is, could, could be sacrificed in the fulfillment of this vow. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we like these characters, but they might do some not so good things in, in the process of, of uh, fulfilling this, this vow, which is essentially their reason for existence. Um, and it's, a, it's something that uh, I'm not sure that it's going to come up in the rest of the series as well in, in regard to the Crimson Guard. Yeah, vows, and, and, and I hope this, uh, again, is, has the, you can look at it in the real world and swearing vows and and then the the consequences that fall out from from that action uh and it takes on a life of its own uh and they even feel uh, well without being giving away too many spoilers their attitudes toward a good good change over time oh you can uh, see it already yeah yeah, yeah. so uh it, it 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 takes on you the consequences of this vow, this action, whatever you want to call it, uh, then our repercussions that we see coming through the, the, the whole series. Yeah. Well, actually, like on the Crimson Guard, like, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about their, their origins, because obviously, you know, there's an aspect of the, the gaming here. But in the gaming that you were you were playing, uh, for the most part, from from what I'm aware, a lot of the, the Malazan characters, where did the Crimson Guard come from? Hmm. hmm. I'd have to think about that. I mean, we gamed a lot of that, the basic original stuff. Um, and uh, it just, it's not, it's not coming right away. I have to say the where they, you know, came from, where, where the inspiration was, if, if there is any direct inspiration, I, I can't say, uh, I can't speak to that right now. Um, I well, how did they fit into the gaming then? Um, we needed or decided to use an, um, a mercenary group, uh, and it had to have a weight to it. It had to have a power uh, in order to stand up to what it was facing, uh, and and so you know it had to be balanced with the power of the Malazan Empire uh, at that time. Um, yeah. So. Um, I think that we decided or, or just swore this, made this vow, um, and uh, that gave it the, the um, power to stand up and meet toe-to-toe -to -toe with yeah. some very heavy hitters. It's interesting, I, too, because they, they're 
intimately woven into this other theme of imperialism and colonialism and the consequences. And we see that again in the real world where <laughs> Uh, you could come up with any number of real world cases of where imperialism has screwed over a, a group of people for years and years, even after the, the colonial power has left or as it, of course, as it's occupied a place. Uh, so yeah, the Crimson um, Guard are, are a creation of the Malazan Empire. They, they are essentially Malazans or people from the Guantali who are against the Malazan Empire, correct? Yeah, they've created their own enemy yeah. uh, through their uh, oppression, through their actions, through their invasions. Right. Uh, you and you see that, of course, in the real world everywhere. Is you create your own enemies uh, by the force of your um, oppression. Yeah. Uh, but also, I would say one other theme there is uh, rigidity. Uh huh. Um, and not just and and rigidity in many different layers of rigidity. Uh, right. Not only in terms of in in, in a, a refusal to submit. Uh, but also trying to to uh, fix a cultural moment and perpetuate it and keep things the way they are through all time. Uh, and we see that in, in lots of different places in, in the Malazan world. Yeah, and often the consequence of rigidity is fragmentation. So, um, you, but, yeah, you, uh, sorry. No, no, you're you're the author. Like you talk because I get shouted at all the time for talking too much. <laughs> yeah. So you either um, right. You either, of course, famously, the two options. You either break or bend. Yeah. And which is it going to be? Uh, and you can do that um, not just physically. We're not talking about a, a loss in a military battlefield, but we're talking emotionally. You can break or bend emotionally. You can uh, break or bend intellectually. You can. Uh, you, all of these things could happen to any character uh, at any time. Um, because I, I was going to ask that uh, about the, the Crimson Guard being perhaps a little tiny bit influenced by Glenn Cook's Black Company. Hmm. Well, it's hard to uh, brush aside literary influences. You know, we've, uh, we've all done our reading. Uh, and uh, liked certain things that we saw and wanted to use certain uh, ideas and, and plucked them and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that and, and see what I can do with that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's all there. Everything I've ever, Steve and I have read, so much of it went into the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, there's a big difference between, um, you know, you, you and Erickson have, have always been very, very honest about, yeah, I read that and I love that and, and I, uh, that fed into this and you can see shades of it here and I love that idea and it played in and this was the author that inspired me. You've been very, very open about a lot of the influences on your work and, and both of you have spoken about uh, Glenn Cook's Black Company. Which is why, I mean, it's not a surprise. Crimson Guard, Black Company. You, know, you didn't even disguise it, Cameron. <laughs> no, we, we are uh, uh, proud members of a storied tradition. Yeah. Sure. A storied tradition of stories. Uh, and uh, that, so we were, um, I think it was uh, Tim Powers. I was, we were talking to him uh, at a, a convention once and asked him about transitioning into, you know, mainstream contemporary lit with some of his, his works. And he said, oh no, I'm the proud member of a literary ghetto. <laughs> uh, well, he would not deny his origins. Um, but we, we certainly recognize what you can do in this literary ghetto uh, and the, uh, the way you guys have done dealt with these themes is just fantastic. Um, so including compassion as well. I mean, we talked about the conflict in, and the um, otherizing and, and the violence that ensues from um, asserting a different identity versus another. Um, but there's also some compassion in, in this story. You have characters like um, Erico, is that how you say it, Erico? Um, the, yep, uh, you have, um, you have uh, some, I think Rillish is an interesting story, his, his, his part in that because he, and betrayal is woven into this as well, but he betrays the Malazan Empire in order to do the right thing by the Wiccans who are 
uh, again, back, these are all woven together so much, but back to the idea of uh, otherizing what was happening in the Malazan Empire in terms of the Wiccans uh, and how they were the being, being um, used despicably uh and this and, and this was because of the manipulations in part by malik rel but he was tapping into a hatred that had existed uh so they were a, a minority that um was uh you know un unfairly treated uh, so you had Rilish, who is a, a malazan i think he's a captain at the time um who does the right thing by by by, by betraying his own people um, and that has consequences, of course. So all these things, it's wonderful how they weave together as well as we, as we discuss them. So. Well, I hope the reader sees that and, and is, um, they, you know, he's a betrayer, so then he's a bad guy, right? Because he's a betrayer. But then why? Why did he do it? And what, are, what is he trying to do? Right. And, you know, is it, is it misguided? Is it foolish? Uh, you know, and or or is that all you can do is is follow your own uh, conscience? Yeah, and he has to make that decision under a moment of extreme pressure when there are these people outside of his fort who want to kill the Wiccans who are basically sheltering inside it, and he makes the decision that has. And he probably understands the, that it's going to have some repercussions down the road, but he essentially decides to do what his conscience tells him, which is to protect the Wiccans. Um, so, yeah. But we could look at it as the Wiccans were betrayed first by the Malazan Empire. So uh, if, you, if you betray a betrayer, it, is, is that being loyal? I don't know how double negatives work like this. <laughs> it's true. That's that's the the wind and weft of history. I mean, it's everybody wants to you know, claim that they are the betrayed party and uh, will manufacture even uh, that so they can try and justify uh, whatever actions they might have in mind at, at that time. Yeah, uh, it's a, a terrible, cynical view, uh, a take on history, but. <laughs> um, reinforced through any long reading of history. But the, and that I, I think is, again, going back to this point that um, we are so used to a very simplified, not necessarily simplistic, but a very simplified version of events that we learn as children or that we learn in school or that we sort of pick up during our lives about certain things, usually part of our own cultural history, because we are part of a tribe. We are part of a group. This is this is what happened. And it's only when you go beyond that when you you travel when you you spend time with people from other tribes from other cultures from other nations that you get this different perspective on it and go huh this seem this seems a little bit more complex than this doesn't seem like i remember or i was told and it's not necessarily again to go back to that it's not necessarily that uh what you were told was a lie uh, as Obi-Wan says, it, it was the truth, but from a certain point of view. <laughs> so I, I like that exploration. I like I like how both you and Erickson play with the the notion that reality isn't fixed. Reality is shaped by perception because reality is the meaning we ascribe to the world around us. And that meaning is always going to be subjectively shaped. And that's what we see again and again and again in this. And then we see that it's always fluid because as Philip pointed out, as you worked into the story, when an external threat arrives, all of those loyalties shift again because the reality has changed. It's no longer this, it's, oh no, we better turn that way to face off against them. That their life reality is intensely complicated and interwoven on many different levels and to apply a this is the only thing that happened mentality to something is is stripping away a lot of the complexity if that makes sense yeah tri tribalism there's another nice nice oh, yeah. theme um and it runs through everything and so yes i mean an external enemy appears and then uh you want to close ranks or you want to um perpetuate a certain truth uh and so that uh say for a, a segue you might have a wall that uh, you uh raise up 
Well, uh, and speaking of speaking of tribalism, speaking of rigidity, and speaking of uh, trying to establish single truths. Well, on on that very subtle segue, <laughs> why don't why don't we move on? Oh, all the subtlety of a breeze block breeze block through my window saying get out. Um, why don't we move on to Stonewielder? <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. The wall, yeah. I just was blown away by that uh, that whole setting, th what you did there, um, and how that wall functions as a such an important aspect of the identity of the and the religion. Everything so wrapped up into it, as the the uh, the people who are on the wall uh, believe that what they are doing is a noble thing. That what they are doing is protecting not just their land but their identity their everything and then there is this other this scary monstrous other on the other side of the wall that are the storm riders um, <laughs> and it all turns out to be not quite what they thought to the point where the um the leader of the storm wall um what was his name I yes to the point where he is such a noble but rigid character that the the fact that he that this all wasn't what he thought it was it breaks him and his only response is just okay that's it and uh so it's 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 a really powerful just uh, element of the story but in a sense um i mean again real world uh people talk about walls uh we have walls and they are an assertion of identity they are, we are this and we are not that. What is outside of this wall? That is what we are not. And sometimes we realize that these walls are more fragile than we thought. And that those others outside that wall may have more in common with us than we might have thought. And that we aren't even what we thought we are. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's really something. I think it's just beautifully woven into this, uh, into uh, Stonewielder, uh, just, marvelously done in a setting that's and you don't even have to think about all that while you're reading it's just exciting as well i mean it's just i for me this is uh so far stone wielder has been my favorite of your books i i absolutely loved stone wielder i just was in, absolutely enraptured by this this book and because of the way you've woven in these themes because of the pacing the atmosphere the um the fireworks the naval battles everything it's just really everything's there and it's just perfectly done i think I, and and you spoke very very eloquently about it in your um, yeah. cast some on both of you spoiler and non spoiler yeah. uh, and I like that you touched on the idea that of um, it having two sides and yes you're holding something out but you're also keeping something in and that I like that point a lot uh, that it's that it's two edged and and it can work in both ways. Yep. He watched our video. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, so we didn't totally mess up there. That's good. No, no, and and I'm I was just trying not to sound completely ignorant. I had to go and find out what was being <laughs> <laughs> so I would actually know what to talk about. <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, come. I would have to say. And no disservice to to Night of Knives or Return of the Crimson Guard, both books that I that I greatly enjoyed. They're fantastic, um, and they they both did like very different things. But with Stonewielder, this one felt very much like you had found a voice and a style. Uh, so that this Night of Knives was this wonderful little experiment that was doing one thing. Uh, Return of the Crimson Guard, I could see all of these themes, I could see all of these things being explored, but, it, you know, it has, it has rough edges. It's still a very, very good book, but I think there were, there were some rough edges to it. But with Stonewielder, this felt like you, you went from a good book to a great book, and the, the transition to that, where these things now were absolutely seamlessly woven in, that I, I think like this this is the uh, the first of your books that really shines out as your perfect voice almost for for what you were doing. 
Um, I, I, I felt that, you know, I, I felt that the, it, the, if things were really moving uh, well with Stonewielder and that I was gaining traction in a lot of areas that I was trying to gain traction in and that I was finally getting it in, in Stonewielder. And of course, you, you do a series of books, you're not always going to knock it out of the park every time. Every books, each one will have its own strengths and its own weaknesses. And, and, you know, and people will have their preferences. They'll like this book over that book and, and things like that. But you um, try and approach each one as a unique beast. Yeah. Uh, and so I tackled Stonewielder entirely on its own um, as servicing its own needs uh, and its own goals. Uh, but of course, using the very same themes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the prior books and which will continue on uh, and which address uh, the the entire world. Um, yeah, for me, it was really a culmination of many of these themes that we've been talking about, just to take one right now, Betrayal. Uh, <laughs> obviously, the title character, Stonewielder. This is a character who everyone thinks of as a betrayer. <laughs> I mean, the poor guy, wherever he turns, he's a betrayer. And yet not one of those decisions to betray was an easy one. And not one of them was a, a, sim a simple situation of um, betray or not betray. It was more like, who do I betray? And what's the least worst thing I can do in these situations? So the decision whether or not to use the stone sword in the first place, he decides not to. He's trying to spare lives. Uh, the decision to uh, betray the Malazan Empire, the, the decision to betray the Crimson Guard, the, you know, all along, he's trying to do what's best. And he's a very sympathetic character. Um, and yes, he's gotten some bitterness uh, over the years because of... Uh, uh, all these situations he's been put in, the poor guy. Um, and and you, don't you think, AP, don't you feel a little bad oh, for him? I, like a little tiny bit bad for him, but he is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I like Not reading, everyone's a I, nice person. <laughs> well, yeah. this, is, this is the thing. I like reading Graymian. I think he's a great character, but he's yeah, an he's, asshole. He's, he's very stubborn. Um, yeah. We've all met people who... You can show them the facts and, and you can see that they know they're wrong, but they will not admit it. No. And, you know, the, the teeth, the jaw sets and it takes weeks of processing before they will finally grudgingly say, we are okay, all right. <laughs> Cameron, we agreed that you weren't going to make fun of me on uh, during this. <laughs> That's right, AP. <laughs> <laughs> But you see, I, we, we can come back to, to uh, Graymian as an example of this, but in, yeah. in, the, in Night of Nights, obviously, we see an event that has become legend by this point. Yeah. In Return of the Crimson Guard, we see all of these different events that will become legends. We see events that are still within living memory. And then we see uh, events that are referred to of, no, but that was mythical. And we see repercussions of it, that we see it all at different stages. And it's mm -hmm. challenging assumptions about the the various factual basis for things. And here in Stonewielder, we get like a really concrete example of this moving directly into religion, not just myth, not just legend, not just cultural practice yeah. and not just politics, but actual religion and faith and belief. And uh, bizarrely, I, I think that you treat this subject because it is a very personal subject for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but you treat this subject with a lot of sensitivity in that we, we, we've, uh, Philip had mentioned uh, Heim and how he finds out that his faith is based on a lie. But we also see um, uh, what's Ivanor, Ivanor, Ivanor. Ivner. Okay. You say the R. Okay. Okay. Ivner. But w we see that sort of that reluctant uh, messianic figure being created and yeah. being very human, making mistakes, but the, the essence of, of what is going on um, being something that is quite positive. And then we see how it gets twisted by other people. Yeah. We see um, Dasim's story and how he is being taken over by a presence that it's a, a, a conflict between the divine and the human 
uh, between the frailty of humanity, but the divine, which may be very powerful, but is locked into an aspect. Humans are much more flexible, um, more malleable, but the divine has an aspect, has a fixation, has a rigidity, to use your word. And so I think where we saw a myth being created in Night of Knives, in uh, Return of the Crimson Guard, you were playing with myth, legend, and perception of truth. And here we move on to that more spiritual aspect of it, tying it into these previous movements. Would, would that be a fair assessment or summary? Well, um, I think this discussion might belong in a, a later uh, a, a cast, but um, yes, I mean, one of the things that Steve and I are looking at is, um, you know, as a um, cultural anthropologist, is the evolution of, of religion and religiosity and spiritualism. Uh -huh. Uh, and and we've, we don't want to give away too much. Uh, um, we're looking at it through the series of the books, right? Uh, and uh, the development of the religious experience and what are its roots and the the relationship between the finite and the infinite, uh, the you know the human and the divine, uh, uh, as it comes to be perceived because originally it was perceived very differently uh, and so we see that uh, and then that this relationship becomes much more troubled and uh, there you know sides are using each other on and it, it evolves so um, we're looking at the religion and the religious experience that's one of the things I, I think that we're also looking at in, in the world yeah uh. Yeah, and we, we see it very much in the cult of the lady uh, in um, Coral Re, uh and the um, the religion that develops. And, and of course, Ivanor didn't start the, 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 the ball rolling, but he's, he's sort of swept into it. Um, and there you see, I think, a, a kind of um, positive aspect of religion where it can be a source of solace. It can be a, a source of consolation for um, the injustices all around in the world. Um, and uh, I'm sure there are, you know, there's so many, what we, we've remarked on in the past, and, and again, this is how you treat these things so in such a complex manner, is we see all sides of it. So yes, we do see how the cult of the lady is, has been based on some lies and, and manipulations, and there's some seriously disturbing things that have been happening uh, the sacrificing of, of children and the, and, the, and the people who are forced, uh, conscripted into working or dying on the, the storm wall. You know, there's some seriously messed up things going on in that context, but you give us all the sides to it as well. Um, so uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I'm interested in seeing where you're going with this too. Um, so uh, I know you're trying to avoid the spoilers for the, cause I haven't read the, uh, the other three books yet. Um, but, um, uh, I'm looking forward to see where you take this because I, I think you're doing a great job so far. Well, I, we're going to discuss the, uh, a lot of this uh, in a broader sense. And, um, yeah. and I want to emphasize, I think, for the readers that this is, uh, this is all you know, under the table. This is all sort of moving along and, or failing to move along by uh, what I hope is um, a, a story that is engrossing and yeah. draws you in and, and uh, it serves, to, it works on the surface. Uh, yeah, oh, it definitely does, yeah. I suppose, I suppose that's, that's one of the problems that I suppose Philip and I often have when we talk about things is that we forget to talk about the surface level stuff <laughs> that, that everyone is actually interested in, that we get obsessed with theme and subtext and the, these, yeah interwoven points that are all uh, forming the substrata of the narrative and you know we we forget that there are these peaks and mountains and, and wondrous events happening that we go oh oh yeah like and, and stuff happened and there was a battle um yeah. <laughs> but... stuff happened <laughs> Yeah, um, like the, the greatest naval battle in the entire Malazan world. I mean, that, that happened in this book. Uh, <laughs> there was some pretty epic stuff going on on land as well. Um, and you have all these elements there. You have, again, this, I'm going back to themes. It's, it's like gravity. I have to do it. But there's the, the Malazan power there. The, I think it's the sixth army that was there before that, that basically 
gone rogue and, and have, uh, is it the sixth? I forget. But anyway, the Malazans who were part of the, the older invasion, who were in that part of, of, of Corelry where they had a foothold. Um, yes. yes, in Fist. Um, and then you have the natives of, well, I mean, who's a native here as well? I mean, that, that's another thing you put in here so brilliantly uh, is you have the people who think of themselves as the natives, the people of Corelry, uh, but you have people who belong to older populations like the boat people um, that you bring in. And um, Ivaner belongs to an older uh, people that occupied this place before. So you have waves of invasions. And then you have the latest Malazan incursion here. So uh, it's, that's another thing you do really well is the, all these things of imperialism and power and identity and the other and all this stuff is woven into these layers of identity that we see here on this continent where you, you have people like, um, is his name Gavin, the old man who is the, is, uh, the, the native who helps the, the latest wave of Malazans <laughs> uh in in their mission to get the various pieces of the crippled god that are really behind this whole religion that, that that's what's being protected here um so gevin is uh a mage uh, uh whatever his magic is seems like an older kind of magic and he seems like one of the more uh, i don't know if it's an appropriate phrase to use but one of the more true natives uh, or he was there longer than the people who think of themselves as natives his people were there so so all these things are really you know just part of this story um and they're driving it all the the exciting stuff the lasers and the fireballs and all the other stuff uh, <laughs> uh that uh, every people enjoy in the explosions i mean the 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 conflict on uh, the naval battle with the um the, the moranth versus the the mages the ruse mages of mare I mean that that's incredible stuff what you did there and, and i don't know if you I, I i remarked on this when i was talking to ap but i don't know much about sailing but you made it sound like you really know a lot about sailing well i hope so i've tried to do my research i'm a prairie boy uh maybe that's why the ocean calls to me so much you know huh. uh it's like the old the stereotype is that the navies are full of a bunch of land lovers from the from the middle of the continent uh, because only they would be foolish enough to want to go to sea. Uh, <laughs> um, and, yeah, I've tried to do my research and uh, I love it. Um, and uh, I hope it came across. Oh, it sure did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was on that ship right alongside the, uh, the grunts. Uh, and uh, a great thing you did there, too, was the perspective uh, that you offered. Uh, you know, we're not with the experienced sailor. We're with the newbie there who's doesn't know what the heck is going on and it's chaos. And, you know, so yeah, we're right in there in it. Yeah, I have a sneaking suspicion that's so he could hide the fact that he hadn't done quite enough research. <laughs> you can he never could blame the narrative much. perspective. Yeah, well, I, yeah, you can never do too much. Um, but I don't <laughs> also, of course, you don't want those info dumps of um, where someone says, well, I spent all this time reading these books on sailing i'm gonna stuff it in there and you're gonna endure this you know three pages of explanation about uh sailing um so just a little you know touches here and there of course that's yeah. trying but, to keep it light and, and one of the things that i actually liked about it is obviously a lot of what you know we've experienced or know about the the moron are you know they ride quarrels they had munitions and, you know, there are these different uh, colors that they have organized themselves into. And this this was the first sort of seeing the Maranth as a naval power. Yeah. And initially, the description of those ships, they, they sound ungainly. They sound lumbering, that they are not the... Um, you know, when we think of sea parts, we often think of they have very nimble ships that are cutting through the waves. These are plowing their way forward. And you don't give them the most flattering of descriptions. And it's, it's that slight doubt then that you see all the way through. Like, there's no way this is going to work. The ruse are, are too powerful. They are too experienced. They're at home in the water. And then it's, yeah, but the Moranth have napalm. Yeah. 
Yeah, who cares how pretty your ship is if you have Greek fire, right? So we have fireballs, but I don't, the laser thing, I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> That's from our friend Iskar Jarek, who's uh, got- Oh well, no, yes, but no, where does he get it from the books? Oh. Where are the lasers? I don't, I don't see them. <laughs> <laughs> we have to ask him, Iskar, where are the lasers? Yeah. So, uh, uh, and as AP said, and, and you know, very accurately, we're looking at these ships through the eyes of seamen who have that traditional view of ships should be nimble, ships should be fast. Yeah. And if you're not, then you're a lumbering scow and you're unseaworthy. So we're seeing their ships from uh, the traditional Malazan seamen's point of view. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's, but I thought that was a, that was a nice way to sort of subvert and, and to set that up to, to create that impression because it makes then that revelation of the Greek fire so much more powerful that, you know, the tension had already been built up and you'd done it very subtly with that. You, yeah. you'd manipulated us quite well, you scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the best of intentions. <laughs> <laughs> but, so uh, of, like this was like you uh, playing into using Greek fire. Like we, we were right about that. It wasn't um, something else. Yeah. Well, yes, it's pretty much Greek fire, um, which is just an adaptation of the, of the munitions. Um, um, because I, I, one thing that I don't think either you or or Ericsson have ever done is describe like a complete aerial battle between the Moranth on their quarrel, which I'd actually quite like to read. And then you sort of think about it and go, well, I can imagine it. It's actually quite good anyway. I don't need you guys to write it. But that, that's, that, that's something that um, the idea of the Moranth actually fighting each other, flying past with munitions. That was when I thought of that when I was first reading these books. That's what made the munitions make sense to me. Because until that point, I was wondering, why would you design these munitions that are so unwieldy um, and, and straight? Like, they're, they're not sort of useful for throwing at people because you can't get back far enough. They're too dangerous. And then it occurred to me that, no, but they use them from the back of flying things. <laughs> they're also, I think, originally more of a siege weapon as well. Uh-huh. Um, so it, um, their response to fortifications as well, like the, you know, in the, in the larger picture, the big ones. Uh, um, but yeah, a quarrel, um, aerial battle, like a dog fight would be, uh, very interesting. Um, but it, it, to, to go back to, to go back to actually talking about the, the book that we're meant to be talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it, with with Stonewielder, then um, the the playing around with the magic and the the ramifications and cost of magic, because that scene of yes, because of the influence on the land, I can't access my magic. How am I going to get my power? I'm going to stick my hand inside <laughs> someone's chest cavity and hold their heart while they're still alive yeah. cameron you very sick puppy can we please talk <laughs> about this do you need a hug and also please tell us how to pronounce uh usu usu with the umlaut on his name because we we kind of had a fun time with that one but yeah oh i like i don't want you to you know stress it all the way but i like the usu that's that's nice. okay yeah i think that works but um but it, well like, it's uh, we, we've got lots of grotesqueries uh, <laughs> happening in our, in our world. Uh, it's a it's a very savage time, uh, brutal time. So I I hope that uh, people were following me with that and and we're and we're going all the way with it. Uh, I wanted to really emphasize the <clears throat> blood. Uh, of course, it's so traditional, you know, isn't it? That tr blood as magic. Um, and here is, is life, right? Life itself, direct. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, like you, you keep touching on that. We've, we've seen it time and time again that that blood 
life, the, the sacrifice of life, that is the ultimate power. We've seen elder gods feed off it. We've seen a, a priest of, of darkness cover himself in blood from a sacrifice to unveil that power in Return of the Crimson Guard. The, the sacrifice of lives on the wall, the sacrifice of the children in the temple. Now, all of these things, um, you, you keep coming back to power is at the cost of life literalizing the metaphor of the thing that we talk about in in this world yeah i think the thing that disturbed me the most about usu is the how detached he was while he was doing this and you there are these moments where he's doing this to first to one woman uh, i think she was a captive a malazan captive uh and she's looking at him and with this sort of fierceness in her eyes and that and, and as she's dying because he's got his hand stuck in her. Um, and then later, of course, there's the scene uh, with iron bars, which is, wow, <laughs> that's just my goodness. Uh, the, that showdown is, uh, so we talked about it as well, where Usu has iron bars, heart literally in his hand and iron bars has his hand on Usu's throat. Um, and I think it's Usu who says, or one of them says, well, who's going to die first here? You know, and that's really something. I mean, that's just, whoa. So it worked. Uh, the, uh, uh, the horror element is something that, uh, you do really well, actually. Um, and it's right from the, uh, Night of Knives all the way through Stone Wielder. Um, very effective, very chilling at times. Um, but it's interesting because Usu is a character who doesn't have that sense of compassion he doesn't seem it doesn't seem to register other people's suffering doesn't really seem to matter to he's he very detached and very scientific about all of this uh so i found that chilling as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah his motivation uh is uh he's he doesn't see other people as fully human they're just subjects yeah. Uh, and uh, in a way, of course, maybe you could say he's protecting himself by, by mm -hmm. doing that, by, by raising that wall between himself and these other people who he has to, to uh, torture. Yeah. And it's such a contrast to the warmth of the relationships, um, for example, that between Iron Bars and Corlo um, and, and many of the other characters, uh, although that has its, its moments where like, you know, he just tries to kill him once, you know, that's, you know. Uh, <laughs> The way that friends do. Yeah. These are people who are inured to, to, to violence. Um, yeah. it's... But one of, the, one of the things that I find very interesting about Usu is through his thoughts, we, we, get, we actually get that he, he didn't start out doing that. When he found he couldn't access it, he started out using, what, what way can, can I use an animal? And has refined and his technique over time. And then with, well, actually need, I need more power. So I need bigger animals. Well, okay, I'll use people. And it, it was that slow process to become a monster. He wasn't an evil, maniacal, cackling, monstrous individual to begin with. It's right. the, the road to hell was, was paved with these good intentions. It was an incremental dehumanization of himself. And we can see that he lies to himself about it like because we get a lot of his thoughts and his commentary. We, we can see that he is he has created this fiction because he has to believe that or he will see himself for the monster that he has become. But one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating is to see how he, that obviously then translates into how he starts to view other people around him the relationships with who he has set up to lead them. And that one's not working out anymore. Let's get rid of them and move on to the next one. That, that process, he, he has become a monster over time, that mm -hmm. he wasn't innately evil. Um, he became that way. And he, he lies to himself to think that he is doing the right thing and it's a necessary thing that he has to do and i think that's a very chilling insight into the minds of of some people who commit heinous or horrendous things that in that moment that entire journey they have taken to that moment that is the justification they need to do it 
right. that if you go back to their past, they would look at it and go, no, I would never do that. Yeah. But given the right circumstances, given enough time, given the pressures, any of us could become that monster. Yeah. That's where the reader realizes, oh, that could be me. Yeah. <laughs> well, ideally, yeah, I hope that, you know, we're just putting this out and saying, you know, what do you, you know, if you follow along, what are the uh, implications of this? Uh, and trying to, you know, get reading into that and being willing, being open to it, frankly. And uh, I hope that <clears throat> people will be. Okay. Well, um, and I, I think we've had a great conversation about this, and and I I appreciate that this is this is taking up a lot of your time, Cameron. Uh, so why don't we we end this here? Uh, let me just first uh, thank Philip. Thank you so much for for coming on and having great questions and engaging in all of this, and and being my reading partner for going through this. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you, AP. And, and uh, while I'm talking, thank you so much. Uh, Cam, I, I just your series uh, has uh, become you and and Steven Erickson are you know the co-creators of what I consider to be the greatest fantasy series ever. So uh, I just thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> no, pressure. no pressure. No <laughs> pressure. No pressure. You know. <laughs> uh, you. So yeah, I really believe that. I mean, there's there's nothing else like it. There really isn't anything. So I, I'm so lucky to be able to talk to AP all the time about it. Um, and I'm so fortunate to be able to talk to you now. So thank you. And and Cameron, thank you. Thank you for coming on and having this chat with us. Like I, I know this takes time out of your day. That you know, this is not your major focus for you know, you're an author. You you write books. That's what you do. And then you come on and you, you talk to us dweebs as, <laughs> as we sit and chat about things. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Ed, so thank you. Well, uh, I want you know, thank me. Uh, th th thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to sit down and talk to you guys. I mean, I consider myself a writer first. And if I was a talker, I wouldn't write. I'd talk. And, and it just makes me wish I was more of a, a speaker <laughs> than a writer. <laughs> Me, me word, me word good. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we're, we're glad you're a writer. So uh, we're, we're happy with the way things are. Absolutely. So. Um, so all that remains then is for me to say thank you very much for watching and uh, I'll catch you in the next one.